Rotary engines do not have a reputation for being entirely reliable, but Andy Duffin's three rotor racing FD RX7 has proven to be exceptionally reliable. We're here with Richard from Green Brothers Racing in New Zealand to find out what makes this peripheral port 20B tick and how it remains reliable in the heat of competition. What is it about your rotary engine builds that you're doing differently to others who are struggling with reliability? I don't think we're doing anything really different but we're using in this particular engine all genuine master parts along with iron eddy ceramic apex seals. Uh, I just want to talk about the apex seals uh, a little bit there. Uh, you're using ceramic seals whereas the factory naturally aspirated engines use uh, carbon and then the steel seals as well. What's the advantage uh, with using a ceramic seal? They're a lot harder, a lot stronger and they never wear out. So in terms of uh, long term uh, engine reliability or uh, engine performance they hold up better than a, a, a carbon seal? Yes they do. Now, I also understand though that the ceramic seals are very intolerant of detonation, uh, basically shatter and can destroy an engine. They're actually more tolerant than a steel seal, but if you do detonate hard enough, then you'll do a lot more damage than a broken steel seal. So it's reasonable to say that if you're going to use the ceramic seals, you really need to have your tune absolutely perfect first? Yes, definitely. Now the engine in uh, Andy's car is a 20B, it's peripheral ported. Uh, can you just talk, it, talk to us a little bit about uh, the advantages of peripheral ports over uh, potentially something like a bridge port? For me a peripheral port takes less time to do than a bridge port. You also get uh, more airflow through the intake. Um, so the, they have better efficiency than a bridge port, so ultimately you'll make more power. So in terms of the airflow, they're, they're superior to a bridge port, so you are going to make more power. In terms of the, the shape of the power and torque curves though, uh, do you find that a peripheral port really favours just making that power right at the high RPM, maybe uh, giving away some mid-range power and torque? Not really, they're quite similar in power, a, a bridge port versus a peripheral port. A peripheral port will generally hang on a bit longer up top and make a bit more power. And what sort of RPM are you revving this 20B2? Uh, this one goes to 10,500 RPM. Now for World Time Attack this year uh, you've gone and added nitrous, well in fact you tested the nitrous system last year, I had a, a few mixed results. Uh, for a start though, uh, how much power is the engine making without the nitrous just naturally aspirated? Without the nitrous it's around 500 horsepower at the wheels. And uh, the nitrous system, this was uh, really essential to be competitive here at World Time Attack in the class Andy's running in? Short of turbocharging, yes, yes, nitrous is the only other option. So that nitrous could I want to talk about uh, how, how that works, so can you talk us through the, the system, uh, what size the shot is and uh, how it's being introduced into the engine? It's about 150 to 200 horsepower shot but it's variable. There's a stepper motor used to control the nitrous flow and the stepper motor is controlled by the ECU. Uh, it increases flow based on speed and RPM. So the faster the car goes, the more nitrous it puts in, and the higher the engine revs, the more nitrous it puts in. So I think this is one of the areas that's maybe a little bit misunderstood with nitrous systems. There, uh, normally or traditionally, a really simple system is a solenoid that opens and closes. When the solenoid's open, the nitrous flows through a jet. And uh, the upshot of that is that depending on the engine RPM depends on how much time there is available for that nitrous to make its way uh, in through the intake port. So essentially you get uh, a higher increase in power and torque at lower RPM where there's more time available. So uh, you're controlling that with a stepper motor? Yes. Okay, so from the driver's perspective, obviously if you're introducing quite a large amount of power uh, reasonably suddenly on the throttle position, uh, that can have uh, uh, an effect on the driver's ability to modulate or control the power. So how are you getting around that? How are you working with Andy to make the car really drivable with the nitrous? There's several conditions in the Link ECU that have to be met before the nitrous will be introduced. Um, of course, the big one being speed and RPM so as he basically as he rolls into the power the nitrous comes in gradually so it's not a hard hit so it makes it much more drivable. 
And uh, you're using that speed uh, condition so that in low speed corners where the car already has more power than he can put to the track, the nitrous isn't being used, is that, is that how that's working? That's right, so it puts in a little bit of nitrous at the top of second gear, more in third, more in fourth, and then all in fifth and sixth. Now with the nitro system, essentially it's sort of a, a chemical supercharging is an easy way to refer to it. You're adding additional oxygen and straight into the intake port of the engine. But of course that needs to be mixed with additional fuel uh, to maintain a safe air fuel ratio. Uh, so how is that being controlled? Is this a, a wet nitro system where the jet includes fuel and nitrous or are you doing this through the ECU? The ECU is controlling the fuel side of it. We've got large injectors and the more nitrous goes in, the more fuel is added by the ECU. Let's talk about the ECU, we've mentioned that a couple of times, what are you running in the car? It's a Link Thunder ECU. Yeah. And you're obviously as we've talked about, you're controlling the nitrous there, uh, what other functions are you using in that G4 Plus Link Thunder ECU uh, to control the engine? Uh, stage injection I'm assuming you're running there? Yes, stage injection. What, what size injectors is the engine fitted with? Uh, it has 1000 cc primaries and 1600 cc secondaries. Uh, in terms of the engine protection as well, that's another issue with uh, rotary engines, they certainly don't like to, to run too hot. Are you using any strategies in the ECU there uh, to help control that and maybe warn the driver or save the engine if something goes outside of um, the bounds you're happy with? Yes, we've got protection set up for low oil pressure, low fuel pressure, uh, high engine oil temperature, high engine coolant temperature, high gearbox temperature, high diff temperature, basically you name it, it's there. So as an engine builder in particular, let's forget about the diff for a moment, but as an engine builder in particular, uh, the ability to bring in these sort of safety strategies with the ECU helps give you the confidence that the engine is going to remain reliable? Yeah, definitely. Okay, um, now last year you guys turned up and you had a pretty good run but didn't quite go 100% your way and uh, we talked last year and you were having a little bit of issue with uh, the nitrous maybe not behaving exactly how you wanted it to. Um, what's changed since last year and what did you actually find the issues were? More experience, second year round and we've also gone to a better fuel, so we have higher octane fuel um, and uh, just spent more time on the dyno and fine tuning on the track back in New Zealand. Uh, so last year you were running on a just a pump fuel? Yes. And this year what have you gone to with a higher octane? We've gone from 98 pump gas to uh, an, an ELF 102 octane. So how has that additional octane been useful with the nitrous, the introduction of the nitrous? What, what issues were you having last year that that's fixed I guess? It's limited engine knock and it's a much more controlled burn. Okay, so in terms of that knock, uh, you're actually using the knock control strategy in the Link ECU, I understand? Yes. You're finding that quite effective because I, I think that's probably relatively rare in the rotary tuning world, would I, would I be right in saying that? Yes, it works well. Now when that car comes back in from uh, a lap around the track, from a session around the track, uh, what are you looking for in the data uh, in order to... Uh, either help A, uh, improve the car's performance or B, ensure that everything is working how, how you like. What's the first things you're looking at? First and foremost I'm looking at temperatures and pressures and then I'll look at EGTs, Lambda, uh, part throttle tune up and drivability. And are you using this in conjunction with feedback from Andy to make changes? Yes. Now obviously uh, with a nitrous setup like this uh, you don't quite have the flexibility that a turbocharged engine uh, can have in order in, in terms of being able to easily increase the, the boost pressure um, but were you quite happy with the power level you're at? What were you actually making on the dyno with the nitrous active? It's about 670 horsepower at the wheels for the nitrous. It's a pretty uh, pretty stout, naturally aspirated 20V. Look, uh, it's been interesting to get some insight into that engine, and in particular the Nitrous system. Uh, thanks for your time here, and uh, we wish you guys all the best for the rest of the day in competition. You're welcome. Thank you.
like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson. You'll learn about performance engine building and EFI tuning, and you'll also have the chance to ask questions, which I'll be answering live. Remember, it's 100% free, so follow the link to claim your spot.